Thank you, Professor Pant. I'll be as quick as I can. Um, I really wanted to touch on three points with you. One was our entry into India, the business model that we currently work with and are working towards, and then the challenges we've faced. It's taken four and a half years of travelling to India and, and really confirming that there was a business model available. This is my twelfth time in India and this year I've been here for five and a half months. Um, it, our approach was really to meet with industry first and confirm that there was a need and that there was some commonality between what we did in Australia in terms of skilling people for retail and what we, what we, um, what the, the employers were wanting here. So our first step was really to listen to industry and talk to them. Uh, we then eventually found a partner that we felt comfortable working with and we are now in a joint venture here in India with us holding, with the Australian partnership holding the majority shareholding. Along the way we've continued to meet with industry but also we've met with lots of other stakeholders and had the support of Austrade and the Queensland Trade Commission in seeking key meetings and also staying abreast of what was happening because in the time we've travelled here India has had the NSDC emerge, the qualification framework emerge, the Star Award Scheme, National Occupational Standards, it really has progressed enormously in that period of time. So we've had to stay abreast of that as well. Um, the business model, I will give you the facts and figures and how we scale up. I don't know that I'll get to the 100,000 question, but here we go. We work on a hub and spoke model at the moment. We are solely based in the state of Andhra Pradesh. The hub is in Hyderabad and we have four other cities, in, four other sites in tier two cities. Uh, the delivery model is a live broadcast model for 90 minutes and then that enables us to have a master trainer broadcast out to each of the sites. It's an interactive live broadcast model and questions can be asked by the students. The master trainer comes from industry experience and has been trained by us as a trainer. They broadcast live into the sites, the, that system gets turned off and then the remainder of the five hour training session, which is usually about three and a half hours, is a very structured activity based learning program. We interface with industry throughout the program, students go out into industry on site visits, they go back of house, front of shop, they also do workplace um, based work experience time slots within the program. It's eight weeks in duration. We have two classes in each site. There are 25 students in each class when it's fully operational, and I need to say this is our first year and we haven't hit that yet, but it's two, two sites of 25 students and there are two classes a day. So each centre has a capacity of 100 students and the, it is an eight week turnaround for the course. We have gone with a rolling start model um, because we found initially that students were coming along and were interested and were being told at six weeks and then they would just disappear and we would lose that potential student. So we've now reconstructed the course to go with a rolling start. Something that's critical to our model is industry engagement and as I've said those touch points where they interact have further been reinforced because we too face the trouble of finding trainers with industry experience. So whilst there's a trainer out in each site um, they rarely have come with industry current experience. So in their employment agreements, we've mandated that they must be placed in industry for a period of 15 days every year. That's just to give them some familiarity with the industry, to give them some comfort and also obviously to give them credibility with the students. It's also been a great way of opening doors with industry in each of the cities we're in. Uh, I think that's, so that's the business model and at the moment we have a plan, we will have 25 sites in the next two years and we plan to have somewhere around 200 sites over the next 10 years. The hub and spoke isn't reliant on it always being five states but it is reliant on a separate hub in every state. Because of the, the issues with language and vernacular, we can't possibly hope to extrapolate one hub across two or three states because the language differences are too great. So the economies of scale won't come from being able to um, get away with less hubs, but in some of the larger states we intend to have eight spokes, in some states there will only be probably two or three because of this, their smaller states. 
The challenges along the way, um, I'd have to say they're, they're pretty kind of, <laughs> they come from left field, some are expected, some are not expected. In addition to the challenges of finding um, experienced retail people to be in the, in the training rooms with our students, there are some really practical issues that can throw you a curveball here in India. Uh, political unrest in Andhra Pradesh has been an ongoing issue for us this year and we've faced probably on average for three months of the year when we were first operating a bund in two of the cities every day. So, uh, sorry, in two of the cities two days a week. So in a live broadcast model that takes some real flexibility to catch up on delivery. Um, we've also changed our selection of location in Hyderabad. We initially went in with our joint venture partners into a, a special, they had a purpose built B school outside of Hyderabad and whilst it's lovely premises, the reality is for us, we found with skill development, we have to be where the people are. So at the moment, we're refitting a premises in SR Nagar and if anyone knows Hyderabad, um, at five o'clock in the afternoon, you can't move for students in that particular area of Hyderabad. So we're moving to a very different location and we've had to rethink our centres in terms of how we set up. Uh, finally, for us to scale up in the plan, uh, we've been in discussions with the NSDC. I think our investment in India as an Australian organisation will not see us through the business plan to having 200 sites. So we are looking to participate in their loan, um, the equity investment offered by the NSDC and that, that money will be fundamental to us achieving the goal of 100,000. So thank you, I hope that's helpful. Uh, that was interesting, Sue, the hub and the spoke model. And uh, we really got to know what are the difficulties also that this particular uh, center is uh, facing. Um, may I now request Mr. Phil Cox, Institute Director, Chief Executive Officer, TAFE NSW Hunter Institution. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, allowing me to participate here. Uh, it's a great honour to be here in India. Uh, I, I keep reflecting on some of the other sp speakers and um, uh, something that's resonated today is that there's no one model and I think listening to Sue then in particular, our models are quite different uh, to what's happening there. Uh, for, for a start, our relationship with uh, India and working in India is really quite young. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, met up with a, a quality partner early on who was really seeking us out. Um, so I think that made uh, life a bit easier for us and um, obviously Michael will speak for himself shortly um, but uh, uh, Michael's got a foot in both camps. He's, uh, he's uh, lived, lived and living in Australia and in India so uh, that, that makes uh, some of the cultural things a lot easier for us. Um, not so much the political, I don't think. There's still, a, still issues there. But our model is uh, we're concentrating pro pro predominantly in engineering and automotive. So again, very different to, uh, to what Sue's doing. Um, and Michael, the XP and the um, XLT and the JP group have an engineering college um, and plans to expand to a number of other colleges throughout the, the land. Uh, they're already heavily into uh, education through schools and universities, uh, but, but making uh, some growth in the vocational area. Uh, so we're starting off initially with a, um, a recognition of prior learning and gap uh, analysis and training model. Um, certificate three in uh, um, light fabrication, uh, metal fabrication, welding. Um, and basically we'll be just, the training's already occurring for uh, the students at the, uh, Michael's College and then we'll be uh, having staff over here um, early in the new year to do a recognition process and then, as I said, uh, fill the gaps basically. Uh, then we're expanding that. We're actually signing contracts later today regarding the expansion into the automotive area. Uh, and part of this process as well as of the arrangement that we've got, we're working with the staff um, that, that Michael has uh, and we're going through a credentialing process with them and upskilling and uh, it's also an RPL and gap analysis and then we'll go through a, a training and assessment certificate for process but ultimately we, we may move into a, uh, a franchising arrangement. Um, but I think 
for us, we've deliberately, um, I'm a, uh, an accountant by uh, trade, so to speak, so I'm naturally conservative so, um, and risk adverse, to, to, to say a, a little. So we've started relatively small in this to minimise the risk. Um, we've got four groups in, um, in each area uh, starting up uh, this year, so we're, we're minimising that. But, but what I think the, the advantage of this model is um, we're, we're going to tinker with it during the, uh, the first 12 months or so to try and get it right, but I think it's scalable. And with Michael and uh, his team looking at to uh, increase their infrastructure, we'll be able to scale that up to, uh, to, to some uh, volume over a period of time. I still don't think it's near the volume that, uh, that everybody needs, but uh, we're going from a, from a very small base, but uh, there's, there's opportunities to expand there. Uh, I, I think, like a number of people have said today, for us, this is a, really an investment. There's, there's almost no margins in our early operations, um, but we see it as an investment because of the scalability here, and that, um, but we really need to make it a uh, sustainable and commercial model for the longer term. And I think that uh, uh, everyone's crying out for that to, uh, to happen. Um, I think that's probably all I need to say and hand over to Michael to probably give his view of uh, the arrangement. Uh, thank you, Phil. Uh, Phil's already sp um, explained the model that we obviously were working on, uh, but I just want to share a few things. I have you started off. Um, we actually working under a 50-50 commercial arrangement with JP Group. So, um, so we have actually have um, set up a purpose-built facility uh, which is about three kilometres out from Delhi um, in, in Bullenshire in UP um, on 27 acres. And uh, because we, have, we want to deliver the hard skills, not soft skills, and obviously delivering hard skills is the, is the hardest um, and uh, not very cost-effective because you've got to have all the infrastructure, you've got to have all the resources. Um, so um, the investment it was at a tune of about $10 million US, that's what we have spent. Even though we're working at a, um, with small numbers, up till now we have trained about 400, 400 people. Um, that's from, um, you know, from up to Cert 3 level, as well as upskilling existing employees of JP Group in um, heavy diesel, as well as, as welding. Um, so obviously, and, and we have to prove ourselves to uh, everybody, I mean, in terms of the employers, whether it's the JP Group and a lot of the other companies that we've been uh, always trying to work with, and as well as the, the student market, because they, they want to know what's in for them if they're going to pay that kind of money. Because, like I said, we're doing welding and automotive training. It cannot be satellite-based. You've got to have uh, welding consumables, um, and you, it's, it's got to be all captive to... I mean, we were spending something like about $10,000 um, a month on diesel to run the generators in, in order to uh, keep the welding machines going. So we are up to a point where our first batch passed out and an employer came from Kuwait and they all were offered a two-year contract to work in Kuwait. And these are all youngsters. I'm talking about all 19, 20-year-old guys being offered 50,000 rupees a month job. So now we're looking, uh, so now we're going to go to phase two, where we're actually looking at now, based on the success, uh, we're looking at obviously, you know, um, get that scaling up happening, and obviously working with the Hunter Institute, uh, we're going to look at obviously diversify within that uh, packages. So we're not looking at, you know, offering so many different uh, programs, but work with that package itself. Like when I say that package is, is like, for example, metals. So we're going to stick with welding, which is light fabrication, heavy fabrication, boiler making. When you come to diesel mechanics, it's, it's channel mechanic, diesel mechanic, and, and motor mechanic uh, because of the investment and the resources and the trainers you need. Uh, and when it comes to trainers, like I said, in, in terms of uh, you know, getting the costing right, we have to actually get the graduates um, and we have to train them as trainers. Uh, first, we had actually had trainers working on, you know, six weeks on, two weeks off basis. But now, obviously, we're cutting back on that. So we're trying to get